Uh, first, I, I, I want to apologize um, for not having any pictures. Uh, I just came to this state uh, week, a week ago. We moved into a place, and it was horrible, and we've been moving out since then. And we just completed the move two days ago, and in the process, I lost my hard disk. But it's somewhere in the luggage. Um, so I have no pictures. Uh, I also lost what I'd written, but I have an idea uh, about what I'm going to say. And in 20 minutes, I can't go that far wrong, I hope. Um, part of what I want to say, the first part, is about what a fantastic uh, venue I think this is. Uh, I want to go back to the 70s, the early 70s, in fact, when I was, uh, I just finished my thesis and I was working in Paris and got involved with a group called the Centre Royaumont pour une science de l'homme, uh, the Royaumont Centre for a Science of Man, uh, which was started by Jacques Monod, uh, Francois Jacob, Lévi-Strauss, and a man named Edgar Morin, who is less known, I think, uh, on this side of the ocean. Uh, it was an attempt to uh, bring together uh, natural sciences and social sciences in a broad discussion to see what kind of progress could be made. And an awful lot of this was at a very highly theoretical level, and I have never seen so much fighting in my entire life, um, <laughs> especially among the French and Italians who were there. Uh, it, was, it was managed by a man, uh, a molecular biologist named uh, Massimo Piatelli Palmarini, who uh, is the son of the great shoe manufacturer which has probably gone to China, uh, which is part of what I want to talk about. Um, and uh, I thought I learned an awful lot. In my title, I talk about François Jacob. Um, in this period, people like Jacob and Manot, who disagreed very strongly about the nature of living things, uh, I'm referring here to Jacob's book, The Logic of the Living, uh, which is a translation of a book that came out in the 70s, uh, and which makes a case that I think is very important for people doing social sciences, for many reasons. Uh, this is also a period in which, uh, in my education and interest, uh, among the people who were dominant in our way of thinking were René Tom, and in those days people were doing catastrophe analyses of stock markets. They stopped doing that for some reason, I'm not sure. <laughs> uh, there was Waddington and his school, the theoretical biology group, which had a tremendous uh, influence on me because I thought they were really on the right track. I'm not sure what happened to them, but I know that my, my, uh, uh, my daughter and son-in-law, who work up the street here, uh, have never heard of it. Genetic determinism took over most of it. Correlations took over most of it. I have a lot, of pro a lot of trouble with it, and I'd love to discuss it. And I've tried to do that. I've done it in Heidelberg at the EMBL um, Center, and they all knew it in advance. So there was no problem for them about Waddington and about uh, people like Prigogine, who said some very important things about the nature of the evolutionary process itself especially his notion of dissipative structure, which I think can apply to the social sciences as well. Dissipative structure for Prigogine is simply a structure that is maintained as a structure at states far from thermodynamic equilibrium. And much of what structure is, is about departures from randomness. And how are they maintained? How do they exist? How do they evolve if they do? Um, at one point, I came to the conclusion probably wrong about it, that by the time you get to life, you've invented imperialism, because life can only reproduce itself by eating other things, by absorbing, uh, you could say, negative entropy from its surroundings, something which is, was also a very common, uh, commonly discussed ideas, uh, idea in that period. I say this because in those days, there were fights, there were discussions, but we all went out to eat together, and uh, in the disagreements, there was a common, a sense of, of common purpose. By the time the 80s came around, that had dried up. Uh, there was a divergence. There was, you could say, the cultural turn in the social sciences. Uh, where I worked, to use the word biology was very often labeled as racism. A very strange idea when you think of the history of anthropology, especially the work of Boas. Uh, 
um, it was, uh, there was less and less communication and culture became a cultural science of its own, using culture as the be all and end all of everything and looking down upon the natural sciences and the natural sciences developed in their direction and did, I, I imagine, the same. This is academic ethnicity, tribalism, which anthropologists know all about, uh, which they should know all about at least. Uh, it's one of those common phenomena in the real world today, but it it's, has certainly made its mark on academia. Um, and it's, a, it's a, a very serious problem. It should be f overcome. Uh, I feel that this kind of a venue is the place in which it can, can be done. Uh, there are, I, as in, my, in my knowledge, there are very few places where this is happening. And I'm not saying that it, it can't happen. It happens, of course. This book is an example of that. Um, very often, it is related to common subjects, culture in animals, culture in human beings, um, which of course are animals, um, but I think it could be done on a much broader scale in the sense that we are all part of the same physical universe uh, and this is Jacob's point. His concept of the integron was a way of trying to deal with the hierarchy, the hierarchy of organization in nature, which ended to some extent with culture. And what was the integron for him? It was what made chemistry possible. What made, in other words, you have uh, subatomic uh, processes, you have atomic processes, you have, you have uh, chemical processes, all of these can be reduced to the level beneath, but it's a real pain in the ass. And it's not worth it, and not only that, there are initial conditions, or you could say conditions of emergence, which determine why you can have chemical equations that don't have to rely on lower level forms of organization, even though it, you, it, this is all, uh, it goes back and forth. Um, and it also is a statement about development uh, of, physical, of the physical world. It also implies that the cultural world is part of the physical world, and we shouldn't forget that. Uh, I, I think it's a very important point. It's, it can be discussed as well, but uh, I don't believe that there's any place called spirituality which ha is not rooted in something or other uh, in the physical world. Um, and this, I think, is another way of understanding all of this in terms of an attempt to unify, ultimately, uh, the kinds of studies that the natural sciences and the social sciences do. It's not necessary to keep them completely separate, even though for reasons that you keep chemistry separate from physics, you, can, you, you have to work that way to a very large extent. This would mean that uh, in terms of uh, let's say the, the organizational aspects of the world that we are looking at, that we can understand uh, culture, and I as a social scientist would do it in this sense, in terms of what it is that is the properties of the emergent structures which lead to them. Um, and I'm gonna skip an awful lot of stuff here. Um, and since I haven't got my pictures, I'm gonna try to make uh, 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 one particular kind of argument about this. Uh, so now I'm going to talk a little bit about culture, but in this framework all the time, that culture ultimately is reducible to physics, but it would be a waste of time. Um, culture as emergent structure. Culture, we began the discussion today with culture as a uh, 160 de definitions, and there are some new ones around. There has been a tendency historically for the mm. cultural concept to change radically in this century from one in which it was simply everything that could be learned, socially learned, you could say, from technology onward, upward, and so on and so forth, to a notion of culture as text, as paradigm, as code. And there are people that I know who use the word meme uh, to uh, replace, you could say, the genetic terminology with something in culture. And, and it's a very, you say, cultural determinist approach that says that what organizes our world, it is the cultural structures that pre predate it, that exist there uh, first, you could say. And in the same sense that genetic determinists would say that genetic, you have a gene, you have a, a genetic base, a substrate, which determines ultimately what kind of phenotypes you're going to get. 
Uh, all of this, I think, is arguable uh, to some extent, but I think there are lots of debates about it, and I, I would argue against it following Waddington, um, that the genetic structure can be understood as simply another physical uh, aspect of a epigenetic process and not a code that tells you how to build phenotypes. Um, in, this, uh, in this sense, one could say that um, the notion of, of culture as, um, from a point of view of emergent structure, uh, would return to some extent to the notion of learning, but would also look at it as social interaction. And at the bottom level, one could understand this in terms of worlds of experienced interaction in which uh, intentionality plays a very important part. So the three aspects that are crucial to this are that at this bottom level, the substrate of culture, it is implicit, it is immediate in terms of its understanding, and it is intentional. And this implies that uh, artifacts are always the results of something else, which is also quite specific. Culture is also simply specificity. It's simply difference. So when people talk about generic culture or they talk about the capacity of a culture, what is that capacity? It's the capacity to do the same thing differently. It's the capacity for alterity, which means that culture is, is got to be brought down to earth and understood in its, its actual simplicity. Uh, when we talk about cultural systems, if there, any, or if there are such systems, that's something different. But culture itself is simply that, which means that all traditions are cultural insofar as there is that learned component in them, if there's a behavioral base out of which these things grow. The second level of culture, which is the one that anthropologists usually talk about, is the level that you, where you have rules, you have ideas, you have representations, you have the elaboration of this more foundational or substrate of, of uh, interactive behavior with its, all of its intentionalities, um, which is where I assume you would find some of the most important universals. So having tools is not enough. It's how to put them together, which means that no concept of culture can work without a concept of practice. The things aren't there unless you do them. And the doing them is a structured doing. And it is that structure which I think is foundational for getting beyond a notion of culture as a thing which is fixed and never changes, for example. Or if it does change, it's simply replaced by some other thing, some other fixed uh, set of properties. Uh, this is what uh, Francois Jacob has to offer to uh, Lévi-Strauss in a certain sense, and it has to do with a great misunderstanding about that great structuralist, um, whose birthday was last year, um, and most people ignored it, uh, especially in France. Uh, in any case, um, he was much more, uh, a much more interesting character than people had made him out to be, especially in his very notion of structure. And I'm gonna be using that notion right here. Structure for Lévi-Strauss is simply the properties of social process. And they are structured in the same way that you would say that gravity is about the properties of the relations between bodies. Um, and it can be specified, it can be modeled, and it has nothing to do with, uh, you could say, what people usually call organization. So for example, uh, and this is where I need my diagrams, but I'll try to do it without. Um, there is something called cross-cousin marriage, which is usually presented as a model. Um, people marry their mother's brother's daughters, for example. That's called matrilateral cross-cousin marriage. But what is it really all about? It's very simple. And you don't need complex categories in order to do it. It means that you, a group of people with an authority structure, led usually by a man, and I can't explain all that, um, I'll take that for, for given. Uh, male authority chooses to have an alliance with another group over there. And part of that alliance is marriage, the transfer of women from 
that group to my group. And uh, this is repeated over time. It is reproduced. The fact that it is reproduced creates matrilateral cross-cousin marriage by itself. Nothing else is needed. All you do is identify the, what people are doing with words, and you get matrilateral cross-cousin marriage. And of course, if the system is based on language, uh, then of course it's very easy to understand it. But uh, if I'm not mistaken, Robin Fox uh, tried to discover the same thing many years ago among uh, African uh, apes, were they chimpanzees? I think they were. Forest, and he compared the forest and the savanna, and he was looking for what he called the elementary structures of kinship because he tried to explain it by uh, different kinds of food habits. Um, in any case, this, this uh, transfer, in other words, is something which is behavioral, it is experienced, of course, it is, uh, it is uh, practiced, and it has to be practiced for it to exist at all, and then it is elaborated upon. It is elaborated with language, categories of use, rules, and so on and so forth. So that when you go to some people and ask them, what do you do? Well, we marry our mother's brother's daughter. But that's not a necessary explanation of what they're doing. It is simply, as Levi-Strauss says, an elaboration upon the exchange relationship between groups with male authority. Uh, in that sense, you could say that there is a, a bottom level to all of this, which becomes cultural or culturalized in its operation. And it is also part of a process of socialization. And that is where you could say the elaboration of culture becomes instrumental in the reproduction of a social order. And this is very much uh, a question of how to reproduce an, a social order. Socialization leads to the explicit use and formulation of norms and categories and so on and so forth, uh, which accounts for how these systems can reproduce. Uh, another example, even simpler, is one in which uh, Captain Cook comes to Hawaii many, many years ago, two centuries ago, and he, uh, on the boat, Hawaiians come out with lots of food, and they say, uh, he thinks to them, come and take. Come down and take our food, bring it up. And then after he's done that, and he, they take the food up, they go up on the boat and they start to take stuff. And he shoots them, because they're stealing. Mis misunderstanding. If one looks at uh, that and then looks at other aspects of Hawaiian society even today, uh, I'll give you some other examples. We go to a party uh, with a friend of ours, and he's an old man, a senior person. After 10 minutes at the party, which is an enormous great banquet, he says, let's go. And so he takes a, he takes a plastic bag, because this is modern Hawaii, and he fills up the bag with food, lots of food. And he says, you do that too, and then we all go home. That's it. Um, as I walk down the street in the village of Mililii in southern uh, the south coast of, of uh, Kona in Hawaii, people say to me, come and eat, come and take. The kids come to our house and they say, I like that. I like take that. And they do it. I can do the same thing. Reciprocal taking. Never heard of it before in anthropology. You're supposed to give. No, they don't give, they take. But they do it in a reciprocal fashion, but it's not measured, and it's never supposed to be measured. They adopt, and today they adopt like crazy. And it's always grandparents adopting their grandchildren. And how do they, how do they say? They say, I like take care. I like take care, and they go to the hospital when their daughter is giving birth, and they leave a bag of clothes. And that means that one is mine. No talk, no nothing. No culture, no elaboration. Important. And if the, the, the poor daughter doesn't want to, and she even doesn't want to do it with love, with aloha, then everybody gets sick, and the, ch the child will die. Sorcery. Magic. Uh, it's all there, 
never discussed. When people go and ask Hawaiians for the norms, and many anthropologists work at that level, they say, well, why do you do it? Why do you adopt? Well, because it's good. It's good for the grandparents. It's good to, to teach the kids the language and to teach them the traditions and all the rest of it. But if you look at the actual practices by doing, let's say, a simple life history, you get Shakespeare. You get people that hate each other in the end, who don't talk to each other for years and years. Parents that accuse, uh, children that accuse their parents of giving them away and so on and so forth. Full of conflict. All of this is specific. Uh, it could be reproduced in another context, uh, but it is a, a specific way of going about the world, which in this particular case is undercognized, and we know nothing about it unless we watch it. You would never find the whole thing out unless you actually saw it happening. This is also a, a very important aspect of culture as the, the distinctive way in which people live in ordered situations. You could say cultural worlds. Um, although I, where I come from in Paris, we don't use the word culture for that. Culture is still high culture there. Only the French have it. Um, <laughs> there's a further level of emergent structure, and the final one, which I'm going to say a little bit about, is that uh, at this very highest level, there is what you could call the non-intentional properties of social life. Uh, I studied this very early in my, in my career, but other people have done it. Uh, the simple example is that uh, in the 1930s, people went to study Upper Burma and Upper Burmese societies, and they found two kinds of societies among a larger group called the Kachin. Some were egalitarian, and they called them the Kumlaos, and some were uh, hierarchical, and they called them the Kumsas. And it was assumed that there were two different societies. And they compared them, and they said there are lots of similarities, but there are differences. Some are hierarchical, and the others are egalitarian. And then Edmund Leach comes along, uh, Britain's, uh, the British anthropologist, and discovers that they're historically connected in a cycle of expansion and contraction. OK, uh, the aspect of this that's, which is important and crucial, I think, is that this cycle of expansion and collapse, you could say, which is typical of the society and many other societies in the anthropological and archaeological records, uh, is one in which, after the collapse, people disperse. They go back into the forest among the Kachin. Less density declines. Um, there are good reasons for the collapse, ecological and so on and so forth. And what do they do? The same thing all over again. Because the level of cultural organization does not include knowledge or discourse or reflexivity about the consequences of that action in the long run. This has been the history of the world. So there's a, an aspect of culture which I, I would think that should be uh, taken up as a very important, which Freud would have called the repetition compulsion. That we, are, we have a very destructive kind of system, and we've had it probably since the very beginning. It's just that the bigger it gets, the worse it gets. We tend to not produce cultures and social organizations which are adapted in the long run to their conditions of existence. On the contrary, lower level strategies and intentionalities dominate uh, the way the rest of it works. But anybody who looks at business cycles or Kondratiev cycles or long-term economic processes will see very easily that people tend to do the same thing all the time. But nobody ever practices a business cycle. There's no culture for the business cycle. There's no code for it. People can write about it, but there's nothing at the level of intentionality and action which includes it. People make money. That's enough. You could reduce it to a very small number of necessary activities, but the consequences are, in fact, the business cycles and much worse events, like the one we have right now, uh, which is an expanded form of that particular process. Uh, so, to end very quickly, um, I, I think that uh, not only is it important to, to broaden uh, our understanding of the world by having uh, multidisciplinary meetings like this, I think that an awful lot of what we can learn uh, is uh, reinforced by this kind of a situation. Because if we've got business cycles, 
where did 90% of all the species that have ever inhabited the Earth go? They're not around anymore. So life has been a success, but not species. Uh, one could look at it in those terms and say, what did they do wrong? And I think that's an important way of trying to link, I think, the, the different uh, social and natural sciences together. Thank you.